beautiful life, almost perfect from the outside. In picture frames, I see my beautiful wife always smiling, but on the inside, oh, I can hear her saying, Lead me with strong hands, stand up. Looking their innocent eyes, they're just children from the outside. I'm working hard, I tell myself they'll be fine. They're independent, but on the inside, oh, I can hear them saying, Lead me with strong. a place where we can go to lay the troubles down eating your soul i know a place where mercy flows take the stains make it whiter than snow and like a tide it is rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes it come alive living water that brings it dead to life Going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Yeah, yeah. Let's get washed by the water, washed by the water, and rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Change. Let's go down, down, down to the river. I've seen it move in my own life. Took me from dusty roads into paradise. All of my dirt, all of my shame, drowned in the streams that have made me born again. And like a tide, it is rising up deep inside. 
inside a current that moves and makes it come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Oh, 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 we're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Yeah, yeah. Let's get washed by the water, washed by the water, and rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. We'll be changed. Let's go down, down, down to the river. And the same. Let's go down. Ooh, 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 ooh. Let's go down. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let's go down. And oh, we're going down to the Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We're glad you're here this morning. I have the privilege of being the pastor here. My name's Art. And uh, I was doing something this week that I, I, you know, a lot of us probably shouldn't do, but I was reviewing the news, right? I'm, I'm going through the news one day, and I was just overwhelmed with how dark it gets when you read the news. Um, and, and as I was sitting there thinking about that, I, I was reminded That in John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we're told that Jesus came into the world and that he's the life and light and that the darkness can't overcome it. And I was like, what an awesome God we have. And, and, And that's why we're here this morning is to worship this amazing, awesome God who brings life and light into our world. We're here to worship him and learn from him. And I'm, I'm just excited that we're here together to do that. Let's pray. God, thank you that you have brought life and light into the world and that the darkness can't overcome it. We pray this morning that we would, would see you clearly, that we would be 
better understanding, have a better understanding of, of who you are and how we're to live. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. victory shout the stone
You guys can go and have a seat. Well, good morning. My name is Pastor John. I'm the associate pastor here at Grace Church. And it is a blessing to see all your faces here this rainy fall morning. It is now fall, so you'll see a plethora of flannels and oranges and these weird shades of yellow. So be prepared to, you know, cover your eyes from some of the things. But it's good to see you all this morning. One of the things we have here is a connect card. Uh, it's a way for us to get to know you if you're new, if you're visiting with us. It's in the pew in front of you, or you can do it online on our website. It's also a way for some of our people that have been here a while to update their information and us for able to, you know, contact you guys. You'll get fun emails from us. You'll get event emails. you also see things like us changing how we do prayer requests, which went out recently. And so if you want that information, take time to make sure that your connect card is updated. Uh, we have a few things going on right now. Uh, first, our men's and women's Bible studies. We'll start with men's. Men's meet on Wednesday, uh, and it's a great group. You can still join, even though we're a few weeks in. I know that Art would love to have you, um, and the guys would love to have you there. And the women as well, they meet on Tuesday nights. And so if you guys have some availability, looking to get plugged in, looking to spend time in the Word, get some fellowship with other believers, that is a great starting place to really find a, a place here at Grace Church. <clears throat> Other than that, because it is fall, we also have a women's retreat coming up, and that's a Thrive Retreat. There's information here on the slide, there's information online, but if you want any more information in person, I know you can speak with uh, Debbie, or you can speak with uh, maybe Jackie O'Blennis, and they'll get you all the information. They'll get you going in the right direction. Along with that, we do our offering time now, and that's another way we worship here at Grace Church. Uh, we're all plugged in here, and we're singing, and it's great, but we can continue our worship by providing for the place that we worship in uh, and the ministry that's done here. It's a great thing that we get to see some powerful things happening here at Grace Church. I know so many of you guys are involved. As we said a few weeks ago, I think we had 42 uh, volunteers on a regular basis, and that's pretty incredible for the size we are. So um, if you uh, would like to give, there's four different ways. You can give here in person in the white box. In the back, you can do it online, you can do it through our app, or you can mail it in if you choose to do that. So, with that said, I want to pray for us this morning, uh, and we can continue again our worship in that way. Heavenly Father, I just pray that as we get into this time of the Word, God, that uh, you allow Pastor Art to speak your words, that our hearts are opened. God, I know it's a time when we truly need your Word. It's a time when, uh, when, when we can't abandon or turn from or hide from your truths. And so I just pray that as, as we worship you in our, our time of tithing, Lord, uh, that you bless it. You bless those who open their hands to give and you bless the, the gift as it's being stewarded by, by your ministries here. God, I just thank you for what you've been what you've been doing in those ministries. I thank you for uh, teens' lives who are starting to see you in a fresh biblical way. We thank you for a place to have our kids where they can learn and grow in their faith in you at such a young age. And God, we just again pray that your hand is over all the things here at Grace Church. God, we pray for all the, the staff members, all the support staff, all the volunteers. And God, we pray for all the prayer requests that have come up. We lift them to you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Now, why don't you take a moment to stand, greet each other, say hi to your neighbor, tell them their flannel looks great, and smile. Good, good morning, good morning. 
Good morning. I hate to interrupt all your visiting and catching up, but I'm going to anyways. Uh, this morning as you came in, uh, you, you might have picked up one of these or were handed one at the door. Um, we've, we've changed up our format a little bit of what we're doing. Uh, the, the goal is to encourage us, uh, more of us, to be involved in praying for the church. So there's a, a prayer list on the back um, as opposed to it being sent out to a, a uh, people that sign up to receive something via email. Um, so this way, hopefully, uh, more of us will be involved in praying. The, the questions, as always, are on the front. And then there's a couple of, um, uh, just a couple of things of what's happening at the church right now on the inside. And, uh, of course, there's the, the journal kind of page on the back that are, are always the same questions. What did I learn about God? What, what did I learn about myself? What will I do with what I just learned? Um, and then maybe a, a personal prayer item that you want to write down. Um, it, important questions to ask anytime you're in the Word is, uh, what have I learned? And then the, the really hard one, what am I going to do with what I just learned? Um, so I wanted to make you aware of that, and, and uh, uh, I, I hope it's a, a blessing for you as you go through your week uh, each week. Well, last week we started... Uh, a new series titled The End of the Age. And uh, we're going to be working our way through Matthew 24 and 25. And we got through the first three verses of chapter 24 last week. And I said, we're going uh, to stop there. Um, and uh, this week we needed to, to be looking at some other things to give us some, some bigger content, context. Um, in, in these chapters, Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus gave his disciples some information about the end of the age it's that, that is called the Olivet Discourse because they were sitting on Mount Olivet when he was talking to them. Um, and what we learned last week in those first three verses is to not be distracted by the world like the disciples were distracted. As they came out of the temple, they, they looked at Jesus and they said, look at this, this marvelous building, right? And, and then as you begin to think about their, their track record, they, they were often distracted by their own desires or the things of the world. And Jesus kept constantly having to bring them back. And at one point, he even looked at them and he said, why are your hearts so hard? So we, we, we were reminded last week not to be distracted as the disciples were distracted. This morning, we're, gonna, we're going to be encouraged by the fact that God has a plan for his creation, which includes us. He has a plan. Um, even if you look at the news like, like I, I did this past week and you tend to think he doesn't, that the world's spinning out of control, no, no, he has a plan. Uh, it just may not be the way you think it should go. Have you ever read a series of books that, that build on the, the previous one? Maybe you've read The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis or, or Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. Um, or maybe the Harry Potter series, where, where you have a, a series of books, whether it be three or, or multiple books that build on the other one. Maybe you're not a reader. You've probably seen movies, though, that build on the other. I remember when the first three Star well, the first of the three Star Wars movies came out ages ago. It's a wonder they weren't in black and white. It was so long ago. Um, but, but those movies came out in, in threes. Right, you came out with those first original three, and then they came out with the three prequel ones that put the original three in the middle, and then we just, just past year, a couple years ago, we finished out the last three. Uh, th there's often in literature or in movies this, this building on previous information. Well, what we want to do this morning is, is similar to that. We're going to be looking at the book of, of, of Daniel in the Old Testament to get a little context and, and be able to build a little bit. And then we're going to jump ahead to the, a New Testament book called 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to get some context there as well before we, we jump into Matthew, which will take place next week. So this morning, our sermon title is this, God's Plan, and we're going to take it in two parts. It's going to be, the, the first part's going to be called 70 Weeks, and we're going to look at Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And then the second part is, going to, is titled, In the Air, and we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, all right? So um, there, we're going to have a lot of information this morning. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make it palatable. We'll, we'll try to get it out in a, in a fashion that doesn't drown you. Um, 
but uh, I, I think you're going to find some interesting things here uh, this morning. So if you would, turn to Daniel, the book of Daniel, Old Testament prophet Daniel. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 9, and I'm going to read verses 24 to 27, all right? Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Here's what Daniel writes, and, and he's recording um, a, a message that was given to him by an angel as a response to his prayer. Uh, he, he'd been reading in the book of Jeremiah. He'd realized that 70 uh, years had kind of come to a, a, a were, were coming to a head, and he wondered what, what is God's plan for the future? So here's what, um, here's what Daniel records the message to him was, verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there, there shall be seven weeks." Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again and squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week... He shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. All right. <laughs> Preach it. What does that mean? <laughs> um, I, I've mentioned before that Debbie reads my sermons on Saturday night, and um, she goes, this is really good stuff. You're going to have to explain it really well. Let's pray to that end, all right? God, we ask as we look at your word that you would make it clear, uh, not only for me to explain, but for those who are listening, God, because it's important to realize you have a plan, and that, that plan is going forward, and it's for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So the, the, the big idea, the main idea I want you to get this morning, if you get nothing else, is be encouraged. God has a plan for those who believe. Be encouraged, God has a plan for those who believe. So, 70 weeks, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. We live, I think, uh, can be agreed upon in unsettled times, which cause us to ask, as we live in this end of the age, is it really the end of the age? Our, our times cause us to ask, does the end of, what does the end of the age look like? Like, how bad does it have to get? We might even ask, how should I be living in this time? It's good questions. The message for Daniel regarding the end of the age started with these words. There are 70 weeks in the future decreed for your people. His people being the Jews. There's, there's 70 weeks. God says there's, there's this time frame I'm, I'm giving, I'm declaring. Now keep this in mind, those 70 weeks as it states here, are for the Jews, for the nation of Israel, all right? This is not um, uh, seven years of, of more exile. They've, they've already been going through 70 years of exile. This phrase, 70 weeks, means 70 sets of seven. The word week literally means a set of seven. This word can mean Seven days, it could mean seven weeks or, or seven years. Now we get a, 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 an understanding of this in, in Leviticus 25, 8, where Moses says this, you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. So if we use that as a, as a model for what's being told to Daniel, then there's, there's going to be 70 sets of seven years or 490 years. God set 
uh, set up a, a, a timetable, if you will, that is designed just for the Jews, just for the nation Israel, and it, in, it covers 490 years. Our God is sovereign. You're going to hear that a lot in this series. We, we have to get that through our head, that God is sovereign. And it, according to Psalm 115, verse 3, he does what he pleases. Because he can. He, he exists outside of time. It, in that sense, he's, he's transcendent, to use a, a, a fancy philosophical kind of word, theological kind of word. But he's also able to enter into our time, which we saw with the birth of Jesus, which we see with the, the giving of the Holy Spirit to come and reside in all those who believe, God is able both to, to exist outside of our creation because he created it outside of time, but he's also able to exist and interact with our world through us and, and around us, doing as he pleases. So as Daniel was asking, so what's next, God? God sends an angel to give him an answer. Because our God is sovereign. And God decrees six things in this passage. Which will take place in those 490 years, those 70 weeks. The, the first three elements of the decree have to do with, with sin. So first, he says to finish the transgression. To finish the transgression. In other words, Israel's sin and her turning from God and her dispersion over the whole earth will reach its climax during the 490 years. Israel had this terrible track record from the moment they left Egypt. They, they disobeyed God, and they didn't enter the promised land when he thought would be a good time for them, so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Then they, they move into the promised land, and they, they, never, fully re, they never fully obey him. And, and as you go through the Old Testament, there's this constant disobedience, this constant rebellion. And it finally gets to a point they, they're dispersed for 70 years into Babylon. The, the northern king, the, this kingdoms had, the, the kingdom of Israel had split. The northern kingdom was just kind of obliterated by Assyria. They were... They, they were removed and kind of disappeared altogether. The southern kingdom of Judah was, was taken into Babylon, and, and so there's this dispersion and this, this spreading out of the nation Israel, and it will continue for 490 years. Second, to put an end to sin means to bring sin to its final judgment and offer forgiveness. Now, we can kind of resonate with that, right? Right? What, what was that? That was the coming of Christ to put an end to sin and, and to, to bring to, uh, about forgiveness, to offer forgiveness to the, gen, the Jew first and the Gentile second. So there's this, this understanding that God has that he's, he's working to bring about a redemption of his creation, to bring about a redemption of his people, and it's all for his glory. Third, it says, to atone for iniquity, to atone for sin. This is a picture that Messiah Jesus actually did accomplish when Christ died on the cross. He, he paid for sin. He covered over man's sin. He defeated sin in the world. He was the lamb that took away the sin of the world. The next three elements deal with the positive facets of the 70 weeks decreed for Israel. Fourth, to bring in everlasting righteousness. That is God's goal. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned back in Genesis, God promised that he would send somebody to redeem the creation and bring about everlasting righteousness, to bring about things the way they were meant to be. This righteousness is something which will which is applied to all creation and, and is tied up with this end of the age thought. Fifth, to seal both vision and prophet. This means the direct revelation by visions and spoken word will end. There will be nothing more added to Daniel's prophecies and what is predicted by all the prophets will come true. Sixth, to anoint a most holy place. 
And this took place a couple of different times in history during those first 69 weeks. The last time being when Herod had the temple rededicated when he re reconstructed it. The prophecy to restore and build Jerusalem gives a starting point for the 70 weeks. Now, stay with me. Some of you are starting to cloud, all, cloud you know, glaze over already. You, we need to understand what, what's spoken to Daniel here because it, it has started a clock ticking that leads us to the end of the age. Now, King Artaxerxes, in 444 B.C., gave a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. It was Nehemiah, if you look at Nehemiah 2, verses 1 to 6, uh, mark that down somewhere if you're interested, you can look at it later. Uh, Nehemiah goes before the, the king and asks if he can go to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. Artaxerxes, he thinks he's like the, the high king of all things, like, and, he, and he was. His, his empire was, was huge. He thought he was the sovereign, and so he says to Nehemiah, yes, that would be good. He, he supplies Nehemiah with all he needs to re begin to rebuild the walls in the city of Jerusalem. Now, here's the thing we have to understand. Even as we look at our own world today, as we read the headlines today, as we listen to the, the pundits talk and we listen to the, the, the news shows, Artaxerxes thought he was in charge. Our government thinks they're in charge. Governments around the world think they're in charge. But here's what Proverbs 21.1 says. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Artaxerxes thought he was making this great proclamation. Yeah, we'll, send, we'll let you guys go back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And it wasn't Artaxerxes. It was God turning him to do that. It was God moving in his heart. Just like God hardened the heart of Pharaoh when Israel was in bondage in Egypt, God softens the heart of Artaxerxes and allows the people to go back to Jerusalem with everything they need to rebuild the city. So when you look at our, our current administration or past administrations or think about future administrations in our country, keep in mind the king's heart, we don't have a king, but the idea is government, man's government is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it wherever he will because he's sovereign. And he sits in heaven and does as he pleases. And what he pleases is that he would be glorified because he's the only one worthy of all glory and honor. When we look at this, we find comfort. God's people find comfort in God's sovereignty. There's just this sense of peace that comes over us and we go, okay, God's got this figured out. And if we keep in mind the fact that it's for his glory and not ours, it makes it even better. Okay, the 70 weeks start with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And then Daniel says they end with the anointed when the anointed one is killed. Those first 69 weeks, or those first 483 years from the point of, go rebuild Jerusalem, to the point of the anointed one being killed, that is Jesus, the Messiah, 483 years, 69 weeks. We have a start date and an end date, which correspond to a calendar. With adjustments made for modern calendars and the lunar calendar of the Jews, those 483 years end right up with the crucifixion of Christ. That's an amazing, let me say it again, that's an amazing fulfillment of prophecy and a confirmation of God's truth. See, God's word is not only inspired for spiritual benefit, but it's true when it comes to historical things like this. There was a time when people didn't think the Hittite kingdom ever existed. The Bible spoke of it. Scholars in their high and mighty lofty towers were like, well, we've not discovered any remnants of a Hittite kingdom. And then they did. Oh my goodness. There is a Hittite kingdom. See, God's word according to 2 Timothy 3.16, 
record spiritual and historical truth. It's inspired. God's word records spiritual and historical truth. So when we come to Daniel, it gives us this picture of what's been going on in the world since Daniel and gives us a picture as well of what's going to take place. Now stay with me, all right? This isn't just a history lesson. Sometimes those lessons are important. Daniel's given a glimpse of the future. For him, this is all future. For us, we're, we're shown the past, and, and it, it tells us the veracity of God's word. Now, we're also introduced to an individual called the prince who is to come. This is a different prince than in verse 25, who's the Messiah. The prince belongs to the people who will destroy Jerusalem and the temple. The destruction is something which happens after 69 weeks, before the 70th week, And we know historically, in 70 AD, the Romans marched into the city of Jerusalem and destroyed it. They knocked down the temple and burned it to the ground. They knocked down the walls. They they destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple. They attacked Jerusalem, and like a flood which swept over it, bringing the horrors of war, they, they, they destroyed it. War and desolations are decreed for and will characterize Jerusalem and the Jewish people until the end of the age. We know the history of Jerusalem. Ever since then, there's been this back and forth between the the Christians and the Muslims. There's been this, this horrible history of war over this one city and over this one thing called the Temple Mount. It's characterized Jerusalem, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. And it will continue to characterize the people. But God's word is right and true. And so we see it. And we know that this isn't just the world spinning out of control, but this is is what God has decreed. Now, during the 70th week, he that is the prince of the people to come will make a strong covenant with the Jews for seven years or a week. During this 70th week, this one week. The Jews will enter into an agreement with this leader who who will rise up from those who live in what was once the Roman Empire. So he's going to rise up out of Europe. If you you think about the extent that the the Roman Empire went into Europe, they covered almost all of Europe. I mean, they, they, they didn't go all the way north, but they covered most of southern and central Europe. And out of that former Roman Empire, one will rise... He's called the prince of the people to come. And he'll enter into an agreement with many, that is the Jews, to rebuild the temple. And they'll begin offering sacrifices again. Why isn't the temple built yet? Why didn't that? Well, the the, the Muslims have claimed that as their own. Islam has a very important mosque built there. Is there no solution? No, because it's not time. There's going to come a time when a man is going to arise, a leader is going to arise out of central to south Europe somewhere, and he's going to make a deal with the Jewish nation. He's going to make a deal with Islam, and they're going to build a temple on the Temple Mount, and sacrifices will begin again like they did long ago for the Jewish nation. How can that be? It's just like Daniel saying, how can any of this be? How can it be that that God told Daniel what he was going to do and then it happened? It's because our God is sovereign. As time goes forward, everything happens according to God's timetable until the Jews reject Messiah and he's crucified. At that point, there's a pause. It's as if God hit the pause button. They get up to 69 weeks, Messiah's cut off, he's killed, and then everything stops. See, we got to keep in mind that everything described in verse 26 will take place 
during the 60, uh, after the 69 weeks, and we haven't gotten to that point yet. The 70th week, that last week, is going to be a week when it launches all kinds of persecution on those who don't believe. It's what we call the, the, the tribulation. The timing of the destruction makes it necessary to insert a pause between 69 weeks and 70 weeks. God didn't tell Daniel about a break. He didn't tell him about a pause. He didn't tell a lot of the, the prophets about the fact that the church would come, that Messiah would come and die for the sins of people. The events since the crucifixion are those which are playing out now, weren't written about or even guessed by Daniel. We have to keep in mind that and, and be encouraged. God has a plan for those who believe. There, there is a plan. So we look back in history and see the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. We don't see a temple rebuilt, nor a covenant made with the Jews. These events must therefore be in the future. A pause between 69 weeks and 70 weeks. We're living in that pause. We're living in that gap. Paul, the Apostle Paul, calls it a mystery. Colossians 1.26, we call it the church age. It's a time when the good news of Jesus Christ is taken throughout the world. It's actually an exciting time because God's word is being spread throughout the world. The gospel is going to people in far unknown, unreached areas. The good news of Jesus Christ, that there was a creator who made a perfect world and then the first humans, Adam and Eve, sinned and disobeyed and rebelled and they were kicked out of that world and that world was then taken over by sin and it was broken. And, and as the, the Christmas carol says, uh, sorrows filled it and thorns filled the ground. It was a horrible time. We're living in that time. We need a redeemer, and Jesus came to redeem us. And now we live in this church age, and it's, it's up to us to spread the good news. We have the opportunity to tell people, this world is not all there is. And it may seem dark, but I have good news of great joy. For born this day to you is a Savior, Christ Jesus, the Lord, for all people. For all people. This is the amazing thing about the church age. This is the amazing thing about this, this mystery, this gap. This is God's mercy in this gap. He could have just gone from 69 weeks to 70, and the gospel could have never gone out. But God is a merciful God, and he's given us this gap of mercy to spread the good news. He calls us ambassadors. We're to take God who resides within us and proclaim him to the world to tell others. The 70th week will begin when the covenant is made between that future leader and Israel. We haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen a rebuilt temple. It's because it's future. The book of Revelation tells us that the tribulation will be a time of, of persecution for the unbelieving Jew and Gentiles. We haven't seen the persecution the book of Revelation talks about. We've seen persecution, and according to they, whoever they are, they're experts in everything, tell us there's more persecution of Christians today than ever before. But we're still not there. We're still not at the end. If you want to read about when Christ returns to establish his kingdom, we find it in Revelation 19, verse 11, all the way up to chapter 20, verse 4. And here's where we have to, have to stop and remember the purpose of prophecy is to call us to walk with God in the present. It's, it's not to tell us about the future. We get it all backwards. We look at prophecy and we go, oh, this is what's going to happen. And we want to draw timelines. We want to say, well, we're here and this is going to happen here. And, and, and that may be well and good, but the purpose of prophecy is to call us to walk with God in the present. How are you living your life now is the question. Because this is all coming, so how are you living now? 
you therefore have to ask yourself, as I live in the gap between 69 weeks and 70 weeks, am I living to bring glory to God? That has to be the question. How am I living now? See, be encouraged. God has a plan for those who believe. Okay, so that's the 70 weeks. That gives us kind of a picture of, of what took place with Israel in the past. Kind of gives us a picture of what was going to take place. And then we have Messiah, 69 weeks. We know the 70th week is coming. We're living in the gap. Our next section, in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 8 to 18. It helps us understand how to live and think about the church's place in this timeline. Because Daniel doesn't tell us anything about the church. So the, the New Testament writers are going to have to tell us about the church and how it fits in. So turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. This hopefully will help us understand how the church fits into the plan. Hopefully it will help us know how we fit into the plan. You may even be wondering at this point, why do I even need to know this plan and this stuff? Because it helps us to realize our God is sovereign, helps us to realize that we're not living in a world that's spinning out of control, that's not controlled by physical things. I have a degree in geology. I mean, I understand science, and science is a great thing, but that doesn't control our world. God controls our world. He can do anything he wants outside of science. But we get caught in this mindset that, that what we can reason and figure out on our own is all there is, and it's not. God is at work. So stay with me here. We're, we're, we're close to done. And when a pastor says that, when a preacher says that, we're not really close to done. But hopefully I really am close to done. You, you've heard the joke. It, there, it used to be that, that pastors would get up there and they'd take their watch off and they'd, they'd lay it on the lectern. And a little boy leaned over his dad and said, Dad, what does that mean that he put his watch on the lectern? And his dad said, it doesn't mean anything, son. I try not to tell you I'm close to done, but I, I, I really am close to done. So, okay, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. Let's see what Paul has to say here. Look at this. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of, uh, of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay, so what was going on is when Paul was in Thessalonica, he talked about the end of the age. He talked about this return of Christ. And he communicated the fact that it was right around the corner. It was imminent. It was going to happen any time. The New Testament writers believe that Christ could return at any moment in their lifetime. And Paul had communicated that so well that the Thessalonians thought, he's coming back in our lifetime. But then something happened. Some of them passed away. Time moved on. And the Thessalonians became discouraged because they thought, those who've died since Paul was last with us are going to miss the return of Christ. And so Paul has to write to them to, to settle them down. See, when we look back on history, we can see how the prophecy of Daniel overlays what we're taught about history. It informs us that there's one more week yet to come in God's plan for Israel. The time we call the tribulation. 
Jesus is going to talk about this tribulation time when, he, when he's sitting with his disciples in the Olivet Discourse with the, the 12. Verse 3 tells us they came to him privately. This gives us a context for the church age, though. First Thessalonians does. We begin to understand Jesus' teaching on the end of the age. We need to be encouraged. God has a plan. So, Paul writes this letter, and he wants, the, he wants the Thessalonians to know that Jesus knows them and has not forgotten them. He knows you, and he's not forgotten you. And he makes several strong assertions in order to say that. If we even think back to John 14, 3, Jesus said to the disciples, I will come to you and take you to be with me. There's this idea, and this is probably what, what Paul refers to when he says in verse 16, for the Lord himself, uh, or the, the Lord has said, God said this. He's coming back for us, and we need to understand that. Both the dead and the living who believe he is the Savior will be gathered by the Lord, by Jesus. He's going to come in the air. We need to grasp something here. What, what God intends for the church is that we would spread the good news. And when our usefulness is over, when it's time for us to be done, he's going to come back for us. And, and those who have died in faith and those who are alive in faith will be taken up to meet him in the air. It, this is before the 70th week starts. This is before God hits the play button again and we go from a pause after 69 weeks to the beginning of the 70th week. Because the 70th week, that's for the unbelievers. That's for the Jews and the Gentiles who don't believe and rebel and disobey. Well, let's look real quick at Paul's assertions. First, the resurrection of Jesus ensures that all those who believe will be resurrected. He's the first fruits of that. Second, Jesus will bring with him those believers who have died. So everybody that's passed away, they, they, they're not just gone. They're with Jesus right now, and he's going to bring them back with him. Third, Paul declares based on Jesus' own words that everyone who believes and is alive when Jesus returns will not precede those believers who have previously died. We find this in Matthew 24, 31, if you want to make a note there. Fourth, there will be a trumpet call, a loud shout, a command, and the Lord will descend from heaven and will have the dead in Christ with him. And those believers who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air. Fifth, every believer will always be with the Lord. Always. When we, when we close our eyes in this life, we open them in God's presence in the next. And as we go through this life, we have the Holy Spirit residing with us. We're never alone. Although it may seem that way at times, we are never alone. Paul leaves us with a command in verse 18, encourage one another with these words. <laughs> encourage one another with these words. The coming of Jesus gives us hope and sorrow. It's clear. The, the coming of Jesus gives us hope in our brokenness. It's clear because this isn't going to last forever. The, the coming of Jesus gives us hope in the face of death. See, the coming of Jesus in the air gives us motivation to gather on Sunday and encourage one another. If, if you were to look up Hebrews 10.25, the writer to, uh, of Hebrews tells us that we're to encourage one another as the day draws near, as the end draws near. There's going to be a time when Jesus is going to return in the air and he's going to remove the church from the world and then the 70th week starts. There's going to be a, uh, an agreement made between uh, the, that, that prince that is to come and the Jews are going to rebuild the temple. They're going to worship for three and a half years in that temple according to Revelation and then he breaks his deal with them and he sets up an abomination in that temple, and persecution gets ratcheted way up for the last three and a half years of that seven-year tribulation. It's, it's not meant for the church. Those who are in Christ, there's no condemnation for us. We're forgiven. 
The tribulation is for the nation Israel and the rest of the world which does not believe. It's not for the church. It's a time of judgment for those who reject God. Not for believers who've been forgiven and are, are the body of Christ. This gives us context then. This is like book one and two. We're going to move into book three, which is Matthew 24 and 25 next week, and we're going to begin to listen to what Jesus has to say and how it fits into who we are as the church. Jesus will return in the air to gather all his followers from the earth. Encourage one another with those words. Be encouraged, God has a plan for those who believe. Take away. Be a disciple and make a disciple. See, Jesus could come at any time. That's what Paul's telling us. That's what the New Testament writers are telling us. He could come any time for the church. There's a set thing called the tribulation that's going to take place before his second coming when he comes as a conquering king. But in the meantime, for the church age, he could come at any time. Be a disciple, make a disciple. We need to be busy about making disciples because we don't know when he's coming again. But we can rejoice. God is in control. Now, I want us to pray this morning, and I'm going to put you all to work. You have the the prayer list um, that was handed to you in this bulletin. Um, I'm going to assign sections. So the far section over here, I want you to pray that the families of Grace Church would build their lives on solid ground of the gospel. This group right here, um, I want you to pray uh, for R, who is here. Um, She's headed back to the Middle East. Um, she's heading back to give a, a very important uh, lecture at a symposium for, for docs in the area. Uh, pray that her travels would go well and that she could freely speak her mind um, on the, some important medical issues. Um, this section right here, I want you to pray. Uh, we, we have a couple openings here at the church. We need a full-time custodian and we need a new worship director. Um, So if you would pray for that here in this center section, this section right here, if you would pray um, for uh, the students in youth ministry and those that are upstairs right now um, in children's ministry, pray that God's word would just be pumped into them and it would become a a real foundation for them to build their life upon. And then lastly, you over here against this wall, um, I'd just like you to pray for the Bible studies, the men's and women's Bible studies, that again, as we're praying for the, the youth and the children, that uh, uh, the, the foundation that we've built uh, in our adult lives would be strengthened and, and um, built even further uh, by the men's and women's Bible studies. So if you would pray that way right now, quietly where you're at, I'll lead us in prayer after uh, a, a few moments of your prayer. All right, so uh, let's, let's turn to prayer. Lord, uh, thank you for your word. God, we, we've covered a lot of ground, but it's important ground that we need to cover that, that helps us understand how you're working. And we 
thank you that you are working. God, we, we get discouraged and we get down. We get caught up in the things of this world and, and think this is all that matters and all that exists. We're overwhelmed by current events, but it's always been that way. The one constant is that you are sovereignly in control and you have a plan to bring glory to yourself through redemption, through changed lives because of Jesus' death and resurrection. God, use us to reach people with the good news of Jesus. Oh, we need that. Your help. Work in lives of those we talk to. Let us see opportunities that are presented to speak about our God. And we're going to thank you for the way you're going to use us, the way you've been using us, and for the glory you receive. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing.
Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would bless each of us as we leave this place with, with a multitude of your grace and a multitude of your peace as we go out into a world that desperately needs to hear the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We love you all. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness.